And speaking to his disciples, the Lord Jesus said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. With these words of promise made by the Lord, you will no doubt realize that the focus of this message will continue with the theme of looking at the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives, with special focus on the way that individuals are empowered for witness by His Holy Spirit. We note that at times the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ, or as the Comforter, or as the Advocate. All these titles refer to the same Holy Spirit, who is united in love and purpose with the Father and the Son. Together, they are one God, and we worship them as the Holy Trinity. My name is Edward Brown, and on behalf of the Pochestrua Methodist Church, I welcome you to this podcast service. Let us pray. Blessed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and adore you in your threefold majesty. You are of one unique essence, yet manifest yourself to us in three ways. You are all-sufficient, having no need of any kind. You reign supreme in time and space, having had no beginning, nor will you have an end. You are holy in your splendor, surrounded by the worship of the host of angels that you created to praise and serve you eternally. You are one in love, ever pouring that love into the unbreakable relationship that exists within your trinity of holiness. You are one in purpose and action, without discord, as you bring about order out of chaos, light out of darkness, and life out of nothing. In the midst of your wonderful creation, you have created us in your image, and called us into fellowship with yourself. But every one of us has, in our selfishness and rebellion, turned our backs on you, rejecting your love and commands, and have journeyed away from you, choosing the darkness and death over your light and life. Yet you do not abandon your love for us, and have been searching for us since that day we became lost. In response to your call, which your Holy Spirit has cast into our hearts, we say, Here I am, Lord. I kneel before you in the dirty rags of my life. I am in need of your cleansing from my sin. I need the healing that you alone can bring to undo my self-afflicted injuries. Please restore me to your grace, that I may again lift my head before you and call you Abba, my Father, call you Christ Jesus, my Saviour, and call you Blessed Spirit, my Comfort and Advocate. For I ask these things in the name of the Eternal Son who gave his life for me on the cross. And in faith, I believe that your love and grace are extended to me at this moment in my life. And I thank you and praise your name. And now restore to you as your children. We join in the prayer of family unity that was the Son's gift to the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The hymn for today is Charles Wesley's Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. It is hymn 274 in the Methodist hymnal. Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. We wait the Pentecostal powers, the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. To everyone whom God shall call, the promise is securely made. To you far off, he calls you all. Believe the word which Christ has said. The Holy Ghost, if I depart, 
the comforter shall surely come, shall make the contrite sinner's heart his loved, his everlasting home. Assembled here with one accord, calmly we wait the promised grace, the purchase of our dying Lord. Come, Holy Ghost, and fill the place. If every one that asks may find, if still thou dost on sinners fall, come as a mighty rushing wind, great grace be now upon us all. Behold, to thee our souls aspire, and languish thy descent to meet. Kindle in each a living fire, and fix in every heart thy seat. The lessons of scripture for today are taken from Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 8, and then chapter 2, 1 to 6. We read together. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to those men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak of. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then we read from chapter 2. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. May God bless these scriptures to our understanding. Amen. My address this morning is entitled, The Holy Spirit Empowers Us to Witness. When the first few chapters of Acts are read, Something quite unexpected comes to the fore about the disciples, and that is just how ordinary they were. They were folk like you and me. They were not cut from the cloth that produced men and women like Moses, Deborah, and Elijah. The disciples, and I use this word in the sense of all who had made the Lord Jesus their master and teacher, both men and women, were not special in any way at all, except for perhaps one or two like Rabbi Nicodemus, There were no Jewish scholars among their group. The only person known to have any political influence was Joseph of Arimathea, who Luke tells us was a member of the ruling council. What this means is that as a group, they were certainly not equipped for the task that God was about to lay on them. Truth be told, the disciples were spiritually a long way from where God would take them. They were limited in their thinking, and had not at that point realized that God was not focused only on the Jews and the future of Israel. And God's plans were greater and bolder than they could grasp. They were to be part of a movement that would move outwards from Jerusalem to touch every country on the earth. 
But before that could happen, they would need to be properly equipped. This, said the Lord Jesus, would come in the form of God's divine Holy Spirit power. The word that we find in Greek is dynamon. And we heard last week, this is the word that gave us dynamo and dynamite. But God's dynamon, God's Holy Spirit power, differs from other power. It is power written in capitals. The spiritual power has wonderful results once it is released into the lives of ordinary people because it goes into the church and then out into the world. The spiritual power of God saves people from evil, from sin and death. The spiritual power redeems lost people for God. The word redeem means to buy back and literally means that the lost are bought back from the lives that they are in and returned to where they should be. Namely, God's family. The spiritual power delivers us from the power of evil. In other words, God's power allows us to skip past situations where evil might strike us. Sort of like happens when we push the skip button on a DVD remote and move directly to the next scene. And God's spiritual power is creative. It brings new life to where previously there had been nothing. That was what happened when God created the universe. But now God's power brings new spiritual life to all who desire it. Let us explore what God's spiritual power does in the lives of his people, which is another way of saying his church. The first thing the Lord Jesus wants us to know is that God's Holy Spirit power grants new insight into his purposes. In the Lord's last and greatest teaching about the role and nature of the Holy Spirit, which is recorded in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, and I encourage you to read the section regularly, the Lord specifically told the disciples the Holy Spirit would guide them into God's truth. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, they would put all the pieces of their Master's teaching together and finally grasp what he had been working towards over the three or so years of his public ministry. And with that insight, they would begin to see God's big plans. The fact is that no individual or church community, for that matter, can expect to be doing God's work without God's direct input into their lives as to what his purposes are. That insight does not come from committees, but from time spent in prayer with God. Immediately after the Pentecost event, where God's Spirit anointed the disciples, the church experienced that God's Holy Spirit power had granted them new forms of communication. Suddenly, out of nowhere, these ordinary people were gifted with spiritual languages, which they could praise God and proclaim the gospel. It is known as the gift of tongues. I'm not going to say too much about this gift, other than that it is experienced in two forms. The first is an acknowledged language previously unknown to the speaker and is given often temporarily in an evangelical or missionary encounter to prove God's presence and power, which happened in the Pentecost event. The second, which is called glossolalia, also referred to as the language of angels, is a useful tool in private devotional times. Please note that both these manifestations are a proof that God is present and not that the speaker is in any way super spiritual. In fact, it is often a gift experienced by new and very immature believers. But there is more to this communication gifting by the Holy Spirit. Christians become more open to sharing about the Lord Jesus' impact on their lives. In fact, many become infectious gossips for the Savior. They become eager to share the message of what Jesus has done for them to anyone and everyone. And this was seen that very Pentecost morning when Peter was suddenly enabled to get up and address the interested bystanders in what was the first Christian sermon. In the most direct of ways, Peter told his listeners that they were blessed to have witnessed the fulfillment of the prophet Joel's prophecy to send his Holy Spirit into people's lives. And that this happened because the Lord Jesus, who they had not recognized as the expected Messiah, and had in fact crucified, had been raised from death to sit in glory at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, and he had now released his Holy Spirit into the world. 
At that moment, Peter experienced that God's Holy Spirit power granted new powers of persuasion. Because his words moved the people deeply as they carried a God-given authority to reach out to those who are listening. Acts 2 from verse 37, 38 records that when the people heard this, they were deeply troubled and said to Peter and the other disciples, What shall we do, brothers? And then the passage continues. And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. The result of this first altar call was way beyond anything that anyone would have expected. As 3,000 new believers were added to the church that day. And as it happened with Peter, the Holy Spirit empowered other believers to make compelling arguments for accepting that Jesus was the Son of God who alone could grant eternal life. The account of Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and 7 bears witness to this as he preached and taught about the Lord. And it says, But the Spirit gave Stephen such wisdom that when he spoke that they, that was the Jewish leaders, could not refute him. That's in chapter 6 verse 10. So here is another vital truth the Christian church must learn. God's Holy Spirit, his dinamon, is essential if it wishes to do mission. Disciples soon realized a wonder. God's Holy Spirit power granted them new boldness. Any reading of the gospel reveals that Peter was no shrinking violet. If anyone was going to blurt something out, it was going to be Peter. But what had been a flaw was transformed by God's Spirit power into a boldness for Christ Jesus, which is why he was commissioned by God to preach that first sermon. But it wasn't just Peter and Stephen that were empowered and became bold for their Lord. The ordinary members of the new church were similarly touched. They were so excited about the new life that was now theirs because of what the Lord Jesus had done in saving them, they could not stop talking to others about him. Their excitement resulted in boldness in their everyday conversations with those around them. And the result was that as they shared their lives and the message of salvation through the Lord Jesus, which day we call witnessing, the church continued to grow. What was more, the early Christian church members wanted to be bold for Jesus. Acts 4 verse 29 records a prayer that is all too often ignored because it reveals that when they began to experience opposition that they prayed, Lord, take note of the threats and allow us, your servants, to speak your message with all boldness. And not long thereafter, when the opposition to nasty and persecution began to break out against them, they refused to be deterred. Acts 5, verse 40 to 42 tells us that when the Jewish high priest and his council had Peter and the other apostles on the carpet, so to speak, they had them whipped and ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they set them free. As the apostles left the council, they were happy because God had considered them worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of Jesus. And every day in the temple and in people's homes, they continue to teach and preach the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. This is another lesson for us. We are to pray for boldness to stand up for Jesus, remembering that every moment of our lives, He is standing up for us by interceding eternally for us to the Heavenly Father. I close by saying that an irrational fear of what some folk think the Holy Spirit may require of us or force us to do, which is nonsense because God never forces anyone to do anything, this has robbed us of his spiritual power. Because of this, the church has been deprived of true spiritual insight and is now being guided by humanists who have introduced woke ideas into the mainstream of theological thought. This lack of God's Holy Spirit power has destroyed our power to persuade others of the blessings that a relationship with God brings. This lack of spiritual power has caused us to be easily dissuaded from witnessing for the Lord Jesus and caused us to be cowards. But we can change all that. Let us commit to praying that God will pour out His Holy Spirit on us 
just as he did on Pentecost. And we can become filled with his dynamum spiritual power for service. It will grow his kingdom to the glory of Jesus our Lord. But let the last word on the subject be the words of Paul, who had been radically transformed by the Spirit of Christ. In the, in the opening chapter of his second letter to his younger co-worker Timothy, he writes, For the Spirit that God has given us does not make us timid. Instead, His Spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. Amen. That is from 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Let us pray. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.